We haven't had a big fighting game on the cover of Nintendo Power for a while, but this month, for Nintendo Power 76, for September of 1994, we have Killer Instinct. As mentioned earlier, Killer Instinct is on the cover, with a more high-resolution render of the characters, something closer to the arcade version than the Super Nintendo version. The letters column has a lot of letters from console warriors this issue. In the top 20, Aerobiz Supersonic and Mario Kart have returned to the rankings, and Judge Dredd is new to the charts, and Galaga has entered the Game Boy chart. The genre ranking this issue is for top, top 10 fighting games, and there are some odd picks, like Dragon, the Bruce Lee story? Really? There's more than a few SNK games that have fit in there nicely. And the Hall of Fame inductees are all classic arcade ports. Uh, Donkey Kong, Pac-Man, and Space Invaders. We start off with the cover game, Killer Instinct, with a blurb about the game, plus screenshots of the Super Nintendo version, along with some moves, combos, and tips for each character. Killer Instinct puts a lot of focus on pulling off combos, to a degree that a lot of other fighting games, even Street Fighter, really haven't at this point. I mean, certainly Street Fighter would let 2 would let you know when you pulled off a combo and how many hits and that sort of thing. Same with Mortal Kombat, but this is much more essential and more of the, crucial to the fiber of the game's being. That said, it's not entirely a point in the game's favor in single player, since it just feels sluggish on my side of things. The AI in particular feels like it moves faster and presses button inputs quicker than is reasonable. Now, yes, I'm using a... I'm playing an emulator, I'm using a Bluetooth wireless controller, but that's kind of a moot point, because I'm not feeling or noticing any input lag either. I Certainly there's probably something there, but it's not noticeable enough to make me feel like what's holding me back is input lag. I'm not blaming my controller. I mean, yes, I also haven't played KI in forever, but again, this is a situation where I feel like lack of practice is what's holding me back. I'm seeing more than a few situations where the AI characters are pulling off combos very quickly and moving a lot faster than I feel that I am able to do given the circumstances. On top of that, it feels like the combos are organized in a very canned fashion. Like if you if you want to succeed, you have to be doing a very set combo series of combos. And I never felt like as a player I was able to really dig out any good strings of combos on my own organically. And that's the thing. Combos in a fighting game should never should feel like they come out organically. Like you should just stumble through them for regular play. And then as far as the good combos go, it should just be it should just flow out. It's not something where you should have to memorize, okay, I need to hit heavy punch, heavy punch, light punch, or light punch, light punch, heavy punch, light, light punch, heavy punch whatever um it success in a fighting game shouldn't be a matter of rote memorization it should come organically and i never got that vibe with this version of killer instinct that said we've got the n64 version coming up later so that either might fix some of this or might make it worse we'll see when we come to it next up is donkey Kong country 2 with lots of screenshots of the higher resolution renders of level environments along with some notes on the changes to the game mechanics brought on by the tweaks of the cast but no level maps though donkey Kong country 2 is a pretty standard continuation of the plot elements of the first game with a few ideas expanded on in ways that definitely foreshadows some of the gameplay elements that are going to be prominent with other rare platformers once we get to the N64. The number of bonus levels, secrets, and collectibles in the game have increased dramatically. You've now got banana coins to collect, cruel coins, and other kinds of bonus stages. And that's all combined with the fact that the new playable character, Dixie Kong, adds the ability to spin her ponytail around like a helicopter to extend her jumps horizontally, which changes up the options for exploration in ways that the first game didn't. Where the options there were Ground Pound with Donkey Kong, YN, yes, no, or have Animal Companion, yes, no. All in all, I think this makes for a marked improvement on the first title, and makes this one definitely worth picking up. Well, Doom has come to Nintendo Power. We have some notes on the port. There are only 22 of the original 28 levels, and we have maps of the first episode, along with notes on the second and third. The Super Nintendo version of Doom is kind of a mixed bag. The graphics aren't as crisp as some of the PC versions of the game, making for a 
muddy, pixely mess, which makes aiming a particular problem, and the controls are also kind of sluggish with some really odd inertia with some of the movement. Also, the music is kind of rough, which is a bummer considering how the Super Nintendo handles game music. I guess they just didn't have the samples. On the other hand, as with Wolfenstein 3D, this is a game that uses the shoulder buttons for strafing, as you should. Additionally, Doom is a game that consistently, across the board, no matter what platform, has given me motion sickness very early on, until now. I made it for about 20 minutes of the game before I started experiencing queasiness, and this is through a bunch of levels which got me with motion sickness on earlier playthroughs on other game platforms. And even then, when I did start to feel queasy, during queasy, it was a very light queasiness, not like the levels which I've gotten from playing regular Doom, where I've had to quit out and just stop and take like a good 5-10 minutes before I can do anything else. So that is a incredibly strong point in this version of Doom's favor. We have more in-depth coverage of Red Alarm, which I am not covering because it's a virtual book game. I'll just refer you to Jeremy Parrish's coverage here. Same for the two Virtual Boy Golf games, which we also get some general notes on. Now, getting back to Super Nintendo, we have... Well, it's been a while since we had a port of a Peter Molyneux joint in Nintendo Power Magazine. We had Populous at launch, and we have Syndicate now. And we have some basic notes on gameplay. Syndicate is a game that, as far as single player goes, really should have been a more XCOM-style turn-based strategy game. Co-op, sure, real, do real-time there. And that said, Syndicate is a game where the controls are just obtuse enough where I don't quite feel like I can reliably navigate the menus in between missions, combined with in-mission gameplay that swings between simple and complex facts fast enough that I don't feel confident I can play the game well solo after, say, bumbling and blundering past through a couple of early missions. I'd love to see the, a game in this style come out as a turn-based title, but as far as Syndicate itself goes, maybe give it a miss. Now, the Super Nintendo version of Rondo of Blood is out in the form of Dracula X. We have maps of the game's first few areas. Dracula X is, in a lot of ways, a more forgiving title than a lot of other Castlevania games are. Dracula X's opening level layouts are a little simpler than some of the early similar levels in earlier games, with stuff like introducing Medusa heads in a way where if you're taking the high road and get hit, you take a little damage and fall to a lower level, instead of Castlevania 1, where the first time they show up, they are introduced over bottomless pits with no real opportunity for recovery. Similarly, the spikes in the game don't insta-kill you, you take damage and take knockback, but you're still alive, and they're placed next to a pot roast and a candle, so you get a big, if not full, heal. It is probably some of the best tutorializing in the Castlevania series, and if you're into game development, I'd say this game is worth checking out in that regard. It's not quite at the 1-1 one -one level of landmark to game development and tutorialization, but it's, it's up there. In Epic Center news, Brandish 2 isn't getting a US release after all, and PTO 2 and Civilization will likely be the last of Koei's Super Nintendo titles. This also means that they'll probably be the last Koei titles on a Nintendo console for quite some time as well, since, from what I recall, Koei puts a lot more of their weight behind backing the PlayStation 1. The Chrono Trigger Guide continues from last issue, and I've already reviewed this game, so let's move on some. The fourth installment of Romance of Three Kingdoms is coming out, and the article gets into the game's tactic system, which shifts things from more firmly into a hybrid of the Total War games and the Paradox Grand Strategy games, except with turn-based combat. Again, this is something where I'm not really feel I'm able to adequately delve into this for purposes of the show, so I am going to give this a pass. The strategy guide for Ogre Battle continues. We get notes of the stats you need to build up and how to grind for them. We have an interview with Howard Lincoln and Minoru Arakawa from Nintendo of America with some hype for Space World, including a tease for the N64's controller design and the N64DD. In classified information, we get a code to unlock Ryu Sasaki from Art of Fighting in Fatal Fury Special. We have the issue with two movie-licensed games, the first being The Mask. The game gets some gameplay and level notes, but no maps. 
The Mask is mechanically a pretty basic platformer. It's got really expressive character animations and really involves sprites, but that's also all it's got going for it. The levels of the game are big, yes, but I'd argue they're too big and too convoluted to make for a fun experience, especially with the sporadic placement of some of the checkpoints in the game, it makes for an experience that's not all that fun, because dying just means a whole lot of retreading territory that you've already gone through before, and that isn't necessarily engaging enough to make it worthwhile. The other movie licensed game this issue is a fighting game licensed from the movie Dragon the Bruce Lee Story. Now, I can't speak for the film. But Dragon the Bruce Lee story of the game is something of a mess of a fighting game. I appreciate the concept, which is certainly novel, making a video game based on a, a biopic about one of the world's most talented martial artists, structuring it as a fighting game, and then putting the player in control of the film's various fight scenes. It's just the controls and hit detection feel really rough, and the, it never really uses its story mode as it should to tutorialize the game mechanics by introducing them as the lead progresses as a martial artist, and in turn, as his career progresses. In Counselor's Corner, we have some more tips for Ogre Battle and Secret of the Stars. And we have coverage of the Game Boy ports of Gal Galaxian and Galaga all in one cart. Now, this is a Super Game Boy Enhanced cart, but for the purposes of this review, I am looking at the Game Boy presentation, and it's not great. I mean, control's okay, but pretty much everything that made the actual arcade version special aren't quite there. You know, scrolling stars in the background, and obviously no color due to the platform. Now, the Super Game Boy versions of the on the cart are undoubtedly as good as the NES version of these games are, but that said, the NES carts aren't hard to come by either, so if you grab a way to play those, I recommend those versions instead. In the now playing column, the also rans are the Game Boy ports of NBA Jam and Primal Rage. And in Pack Watch, we get a look at The Lost Vikings 2. My pick of the issue is Donkey Kong Country 2. Now, Doom has the advantage of being a version of the game which I was able to play for almost half an hour and not get motion sick, which that's a big step in its favor. But on the minus side, it's also a version of Doom where. It looks crap. Graphically, it does not hold up compared to Doom played on any modern console or even on any PC with even fairly basic specs. Um, I, any computer these days can play Doom just fine. So there's no reason. So there's no reason to say not play the PC version of Doom. Doom is more available now than it ever has been. There are better ways to play it than the Super Nintendo version. And Dracula X, it's a great game. It plays incredibly well. It's also super duper duper expensive. So, there's that. So, Donkey Kong Country 2 is my recommendation. If you do manage to stumble across a legit copy of uh, Dracula X for a steal, go for it. Also, worth checking out an emulator, but otherwise, if you're looking to build your collection on a lower but on a more reasonable budget, Donkey Kong 2, Country 2 is the way to go. Later games are going to be more expensive, but Donkey Kong Country 2 is still somewhat reasonably priced. Next time, we get Yoshi's Island. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any f future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, Tossing me a few bucks also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.